Good morning. I'm showing 9 o'clock, so we're going to go ahead and get started. My name is Mike DeLaCluse, President of Lessman Instrument Company. I'd like to thank all of you for taking time out of your busy schedules to join us for when there are so many level technologies, why would you use a level bubbler? Presented by Lessman's own Dan Wisey. In the next 45 minutes or so, we're going to cover some key topics like a quick review, what is a, what is a level bubbler, some full disclosures, the pros and cons, who still uses bubblers and why? How does the Lessman bubbler system stack up against the others? And then we'll take some question and answers. Dan's been involved in all facets of process instrumentation since 1978, from sales and commissioning to service and support. He's a longtime member of ISA and has been with Lessman since 1988. Dan's the primary contributor to our process solutions blog and routinely travels to Lessman customers to help solve their instrumentation problems and help them get the most out of the technology they use. In Dan's own words, he's the guy who reads all the manuals that nobody else does. In Lessman's customer words, he's the trainer to call if you want to cut to the so what of instrumentation. We will be muting the phone lines. If you have a question, uh, there is a chat tool or question tool within GoToMeeting. Please just type us your question and I'll make sure we get it answered. With that, I'll turn it over to Dan. Thank you, Mike. Yeah, we're going to do Bubblers 101 today, and it's a very venerable technology. As you can see, we got the calendar from 1960 up there because the book that I took that screenshot out of for the basic bubbler was printed in 1960, and it goes back even further than that into the 30s, although I couldn't find a, a, snip, a screenshot to take of that. But the reason bubblers are still used today is the fact, basically, that they work. So for those of you who might not have been involved in this for very long, let's just go see what bubblers are basically used for. A bubbler takes a measurement where other things interfere with other technologies, like foam, steam, uh, water that condenses on the horn of a radar antenna or on the uh, diaphragm of a, an ultrasonic transducer, when you've got a lot of surface turbulence that can't be averaged out where there's solid content or debris that makes other, these, other measurement technologies impractical. There's a short list there, and we're going to go through those in detail further on in the presentation. Uh, but before we get into the details of each application, let's just go into what makes a basic bubbler. A basic bubbler has some kind of supply, air or gas, that comes into it. It goes into a flow regulator, flows down the tube here, and makes bubbles in the liquid. And generally, in order to, to manage this, we're, we're doing it because we want a measurement. So we've got either a pressure transducer or a gauge or something up on top that tells us what the back pressure in the tube is. So that's your basic bubble. The way it works is you can see here we've got this illustration. We've got a glass with some liquid in it and a straw. And if you blow into the straw, the pressure in that straw is just enough to uh, blow bubbles out the bottom, the pressure in there is going to be the same as the height of the liquid, the hydrostatic head and the column of liquid there. So it's the same pressure. If that hydrostatic head is, as you can see here, 0.18 PSI, the pressure is going to be the same here, 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 and here, and all the way across. So if we do that with a, in, an, in, in an industrial situation, we just measure the back pressure in the tube there in order to determine what the hydrostatic pressure of the liquid column is. You've got to realize that you need a higher pressure to blow bubbles into a denser medium than a less dense medium. So if you're trying to do this in syrup, for the same level, you have to have more pressure to push a bubble out through syrup than you do through water. Or if you have a higher column of liquid, it needs a higher pressure. A 250-foot column of water has a pressure of over 100 psi. So what do you get? If you install a bubbler, the question is, what do you get out of it? Well, there's a front panel indicator that shows you level and presumably with uh, units up there, inches or feet or millimeters, whatever it is. You get a 4 to 20 milliamp signal out that's proportional to level. There are also alarm relays, or if you want to configure it that way, have a control relay with a wide adjustable dead band so that you can do pump up or pump down applications plus all the other components in, in there that will go through, like the constant uh, flow regulator that actually make a bubbler work. 
Here's an example of a bubbler panel. You can see the panel or the uh, digital indicator on the back side of the door. There's a pressure transmitter over here. This is the constant flow regulator with a rotometer down here, and then the coalescing filter with its uh, pressure gauge. And the little black box on the bottom down here is a heater with a thermostat, and there's some electronic or electrical wiring terminals up on the top. So that's the spread of a panel, control panel. So individually, you've got a supply line regulator on there. Typically, supply comes in at whatever the uh, line is. It could be 90 to 130 PSI. Uh, it all depends on what is needed for this. But we frequently find that these are installed outside the panel. And in the wintertime, that can be a problem here in the northern climates because any water that's in the supply line can freeze. That will bind up the components on the inside. You can get loss of air supply, loss of signal. So we put the regulator right in the panel. There's a panel heater in there that keeps the uh, panel components warm and above freezing so that if there is water in there before it hits the filter, coalescing filter, it won't freeze and uh, take the uh, regulator out of service. The rule of thumb for supply pressure is you need 10 PSI more than whatever the maximum level needs to force a bubble out the dip tube. And we put a pressure gauge on there so that the guy that opens the panel can read what the pressure on the supply, on the supply side is. We put a coalescing filter in here. In order to make this work, you need clean, dry purge gas going out that dip tube. Well, sometimes it isn't clean, nor is it dry. So the coalescing filter is like an insurance policy. It drops the moisture out. It does that because it's got that real, it's got that filter in it with a real tiny uh, hole in it that are 0.3 micron filter that actually not only takes the dirt out, but it'll trap the oil and the uh, water that drops out the bottom and then sits in the bowl at that point. So be, this is done because the next slide shows you the uh, flow controller and that's got little tiny orifices in it. It's a little pneumatic controller. You can't get dirt in there. You can't get water in there that will freeze in ice crystals because it will cease to function at that point, and then you don't no longer have a bubbler, an operating bubbler system. Here's our constant flow regulator. It's the part here with the diaphragm on it, and attached to it is a rotometer that shows the flow, and it regulates a relatively small and low flow, hopefully uninterrupted flow, of either air or gas like nitrogen. It is a differential regulator. It used to be called a differential relay, but since we're, we moved into electronics and away from pneumatics, a lot of people don't recognize the term differential relay, but its output is constant flow. When you have a flow going out, the pressure in the line varies with level because the flow is held constant. This is not like the, the kind of regulator you got on the output of your uh, air compressor that attempts to maintain a constant pressure, and the flow varies according to whatever it needs to maintain the constant pressure. In our case, we want to measure the pressure so we create a constant flow. This is done by looking at the differential, because according to Bernoulli's equation, the flow varies with the square root of the, of the uh, pressure on there. So if you know what the pressure is, if you can maintain that, it has a correlation to the flow going out of it. The flow rate is relatively low, primarily because we don't want a whole bunch of air flowing through the dip tube because we could actually get pressure losses in that. And also just to minimize the air of the gas consumption because it takes gas to make this operate. It always costs money to compress air or to get compressed gas, and we want to minimize those costs. You don't have to control to an exact flow rate. The rule of thumb is you need just enough flow to bubble. I've looked through probably 30 different manuals and texts on this kind of stuff, and I found in the literature anything from 0.1 to 1 standard cubic feet per hour as a minimum through there. On our little regulator, there's a little tiny screw down here where the blue arrow is pointing. It's a screwdriver adjustment that adjusts the output flow rate, and you can see that change with a floating ball on the rotometer over here. At the factory, we set that to 1 standard cubic foot per hour. I think the range goes up to 2.5 or 3 on that rotometer. You can pick whatever you need for it, uh, but it's just a visual indication to tell you that you still actually have flow running out the system there. The purge gas has to be clean and dry, and the reason for this is that yeah, the tiny, little tiny components in the regulator, the little orifices, if they get clogged up with either ice crystals or dirt, uh, they just won't operate. We do put a thermostatically controlled heater in the panel in order to prevent the thing from freezing up in the wintertime. Whoops, I got a thing up there. I got that. 
And you have to be, we've actually had inquiries to use bubblers on hot, nasty stuff. And the example they, uh, they wanted to use it for was molten sulfur. And my concern was you got to be real sure that you don't put compressed air into molten sulfur because you really can't take uh, compressed air from the atmosphere, I think, and get it dry enough to stick it in the molten sulfur because any water that goes in the molten sulfur will turn into a steam explosion and throw stuff all over the place. That's a case where you really have to use an inert gas because when they separate the gases, they can take all the water out of it. The, the other thing you got to be aware of is that you have to be compatible with, a, with, with whatever you're bubbling into. Now, I, I'm going to guess that 90% of what we do is water, 95% probably, so air works just fine for that. But if you've got something that you're trying to bubble into that reacts with the 20% oxygen that's in an air in the air mixture, uh, then you have to use some kind of other gas, uh, carbon dioxide or nitrogen or something like that that isn't going to react with your uh, material. We use a pressure transmitter to read the back pressure in the tube to give us the level reading. These are industrial rated pressure transmitters. They're smart transmitters. They have heart in them. You don't have to have heart to set them up. We set them up according to your specification. You tell us what range you want on it. We'll set it up and configure both the transmitter and the display to read level directly in there. But if you want heart coming out of it, you've got that. Most people will take the signal back to a control system somewhere so that they can actually get an electronic reading of what the level is they, and also do, other, also do their control off of it. The digital indicator uh, has the, uh, both the digital numbers on it for level and the uh, scale on it written out in inches, feet, millimeters, whatever it is. And you can also see the photograph of the uh, panel inside the uh, door up there. There are six characters for units, so you can make it real clear what you're dealing with here. The panel heater in the bottom down there just keeps it from freezing in the wintertime. We get the, it's thermostatically controlled so it doesn't waste energy in the summertime. The whole idea is to not have ice crystals uh, getting into the constant flow regulator. The enclosures we offer are, are either carbon steel or stainless steel. It's a gasketed door, hinge door, so you get NEMA 4. Or with, obviously with a stainless steel, you get NEMA 4X. So this is coming to you with all the components mounted, wired, ready to go, hang it out in the field out there. Now, we've got a, the basic bubbler is the one that we saw on the very first slide there. And this is for open tanks or open pits or sumps. A lot of these go into a sump where they, because it's easy to get a pipe down the top and uh, bubble, the, bubble the gas into it. And again, this is, we get a supply air coming in here. We filter it. We put it through our constant flow regulator with an indicator. comes up the tube, comes like this, goes down the dip tube down here, and the bubbles come up the bottom. And connected to this, because the pressure is all the same along this line right here, if we tap into it, we've got a pressure transmitter up here, reads the pressure. So those are the components that make the basic bubbler work. And now we'll look at the list of the other ones to see how they vary from this design to get these different kinds of level measurements. Uh, this is just the second slide again that shows you use a single DP and a single regulator for an open tank or an open sump for the basic bubbler. For a differential bubbler, we actually have two dip tubes and a differential pressure regulator. The example here is where liquid flows through a screen or a filter. And as that filter clogs, the level on the upstream side over here will tend to rise because the flow is not going as quickly through the filter or the screen. And the level on the downstream side will tend to go down because not as much liquid is flowing through the clogged screen or filter. So what a, what a differential bubbler does, or differential system does, is it measures the level here on the downstream side, measures it the liquid level here on the upstream side, puts both of those signals into a differential pressure transmitter, and it gives you the difference. So when the screen is brand new, you're going to have a very low difference in level, and that can be your reference point. And as the screen clogs, you're going to get more and more difference in level between the upstream side and the downstream side. And at some point or another, the control system is going to say, whoa, i gotta, I got to do some cleaning somehow or another, whatever that turns out to be. Sometimes it's a backwash, sometimes it's a spray, sometimes they turn the... Uh, conveyor on in order to get rid of the debris, whatever that turns out to be. So that's a differential bubbler. Bubblers have been used for density uh, for a long time now, since the 40s. 
When you do density with bubbler, there has to be something in the system that's a constant or a fixed element. There's two ways of doing it. You can do it with a single bubbler tube, as we see on the left, or with two bubbler tubes, as we see over here on the right. When you have a single tube density bubbler, the constant is the fact that the level is maintained here because you have a weir overflow. So you have to make sure that enough liquid comes in here so that it's always maintaining a constant level. With a constant level, as the density varies in this liquid part right here, the output of level will reflect that. And it isn't actually a level change, it's actually a density change. And the same thing happens over here when you have two tubes going down there. The, the difference between the height of the tubes is fixed, and therefore a change in density will give you a change in reading over here. You have to use very low range DP transmitters to make this work because you're looking at a very small change in density. So it needs to be a low range DP, almost a draft range DP uh, transmitter in order to make this work. An interface bubbler is almost the same kind of operation here. Interface is where you have two different liquid levels, for instance, water and oil. We know that the water is going to go to the bottom because it's denser and oil goes to the top because it is less dense. And you, people want to know where is the level interface between those two. So that's represented by the line down, running down the center down here. So again, something has to be constant. We either have to have an overflow so we maintain a constant level with a single tube, or we have to have two tubes up here. The interface level has to be between the tubes. And you have to have some, uh, generally in order for this to work at all, you have to know what the, what, the, what the specific gravities are of the two elements in there. Constantly changing specific gravities won't work with this. You have to know that the one on the bottom, for instance, is going to be water, and it's going to have a specific gravity of 1, and the oil on the top is going to have a specific gravity of 0.87, something like that. Otherwise, your measurements are, are off by relative to whatever the changes in uh, specific gravity are. But it's been done like this, and it's still done today. In a closed tank, it's not a vented tank, you can have a bubbler where you use, again, you have to have a DP transmitter on this, but you only have one bubbler tube. So the air comes in, gets constant flow regulated, comes up and around, creates the bubbles down here. But the second tube is just an impulse tube in the vapor space up here, running over to the low side of the differential pressure transmitter. And this is measurement just like DP for level is when you got uh, on the outside of the tank. We, we, it subtracts the vapor pressure from the combined vapor pressure plus liquid head down here to get just the level of the liquid coming out of it. So this is one impulse tube, one constant flow regulator, but you use a DP transmitter in order to get the results. Maintenance is you know, people say they're high maintenance, and generally that comes from the fact that you got to purge the dip tube if it gets clogged up. Uh, what a lot of people forget to do is, if they're supplying compressed air to this thing, is they got to blow down water that collects in the bowl and the supply filter bowl in that. So somebody's got to go out and get rid of the water in the system. Ideally, you want to use instrument air for this. If you've got instrument air, that's great, but a lot of people end up using just ordinary compressed air for it and you got to blow the water out of the system. Also, that coalescing filter element needs replacement on occasion. And in cases where you've got really bad stuff that you can actually clog up the tube, I put this diagram in here because this, this shows you putting a T at the top of the dip tube with a plug on it. You can take the plug out and then use a rod to rod out the dip tube in that fashion. So supply air comes, or the uh, regulated air comes down from the top and then like this, but you got a, a spot that you can uh, rot out the uh, dip tube. That's pretty extreme service. You know, what are the gotchas or the stumbling blocks for this? Well, all of this assumes that you have a constant specific gravity or density for the material you're measuring. Any deviation from that assumed specific gravity is a proportional error in the measurement. And that's just inherent in the measurement. So if the, if the specific gravities are constantly changing, Probably, you know, this is not going to be the ideal technology to, to do that. Frankly, we look at hopefully something like uh, uh, load cells or something to uh, compensate for that. It is a contacting technology. In other words, the dip tube actually has to go into the material that you're dealing with. Uh, we've got uh, 
a guy that uses this and he has to replace his dip tube about monthly because it literally gets banged up uh, by the way that it's in a big pit. It goes down there and as the dump trucks dump stuff into that pit, it actually gets damaged. But it's inexpensive. He says, yeah, it's only 20 feet of pipe. You screw, a, you know, I take another one and I stick it in there and it's cheap. It doesn't cost all that much. The key about this is it might be a contacting technology for the dip tube, but the pressure sensor or the transmitter that's making the measurement does not contact the medium. That's the problem with a bunch of other types of things that stick into the tank is they have to look at the acid vapors or the corrosive medium that's in there and they get affected by it. With this, you know, if you put a plastic or a PVC a pipe down into a sulfuric acid tank, it doesn't contact the medium, nor does the transmitter. The transmitter is just seeing the clean nitrogen that you're blowing in there, not the sulfuric acid vapors. And you got to be aware that any pressure drop in the regulated supply piping going out of the panel and down to the dip tube is a measurement error. And so when you go to make a dip tube or that piping, you don't want to use a pipe that's too small a diameter. Obviously, if you get any interrupted flow, that's going to cause a, a disruption of the measurement. If you have a leak in the regulated line, that's a false low level. And if you get a blockage in that same regulated line, you get a false high level. So what, is, what does Lessman offer in all this? What we're really selling is what we call field-proven workhorse components. The Siemens 62VA constant flow regulator is the same one that was originally the Moore product, 62VA, that have been sold for 50 years before Siemens bought Moore. So that has you know, literally a 60 or 70 year history of being used in uh, bubblers. It is just absolutely the standard of the industry. And it includes the rotometer on there, so you get the visual indication of flow. We use the industrial smart pressure transmitters. In our case, we use the Siemens. It's got the heart on it. It's got the integral keypad and display, so that if you do have to rearrange it in the field, you don't even need heart. You just use the keyboard display. We put the coalescing filter right in the panel to trap out that final bit of moisture or dirt. Got the big display on the front so that you can read the level on there. Uh, we have an option for a push button purge. So you hold the push button in, air flows down the tube, purges it out. And you get a panel that's already built, tested, and ready to install and range to whatever your range is so you can just mount it and run it. Uh, the panels are carbon steel. Actually, we, we've only got the four choices. We've got carbon or stainless steel panels. We have two ranges, 5 inches to 100 foot depth or 100 feet to 340 foot depth measurements. You have to be aware that we're supplying you the panel. So what would you have to do to make this work? You have to pipe supply air or gas to the panel. You have to pipe the regulated air or gas from the panel out to the dip tube. You have to make a dip tube. And there's a couple slides showing you what that, what's involved with for that. You have to supply AC electrical power to the panel because that powers the digital readout and the transmitter. And if you want to take the signal back, you want to supply loop power to that uh, to get the 4 to 20 milliamp signal out of it. For dip tube fabrication, it's just the pipe that you suspend from the top with either a flange or threads. You don't want it too tiny. We had somebody actually put in a 1 inch, 8 inch tubing and ran it. Uh, it was just uh, that uh, uh, polyflow type plastic tubing and they ran it 100 feet. And that was just too much air resistance. They got an, an artificially high level because there was so much resistance to the, to the flow through it. It's got to have enough mechanical strength to stand up, uh, but you can match the materials of the dip tube to whatever you're putting it in. You can use PVC or steel. The only fabrication beyond mounting it is that you have to have a notch. You don't have to have a notch, but a notch gives you a nice place for the bubbles to actually come out of. And you can see on the little diagram down here, just take a grinder and you grind a 60 degree. Most people actually make it a 90 degree. It doesn't matter. Notch here, and the bubbles actually come right out where the top of the notches at that point. Where the, where the top of that notch is becomes the datum or the zero reference point for the level. And then the insertion depth, how far you put it down, that then, you know, wherever that notch is relates to how far down you push it and that becomes your zero level point. You might have to, if it gets very long, have mechanical supports for the dip tube. And this is a top-down view right here. You're looking down on the dip tube and sometimes people have to put weld on a uh, bracket on either side and support it to the tank wall 
or whatever you, you're sticking into in order to uh, support it. So to sum up why bubblers are still used and why they've been used for about a century now, well, it's proven technology. You know, it's simple in both design and its construction. People tell us over and over again, we want it because the guys that we've got on our maintenance staff here can figure out what's wrong and fix it if it stops working. It's that simple. Uh, it's ideal for a level access that requires a top access and a dip tube, which is typically half inch or an inch pipe, can fit through a one inch threaded hole on the top of a tank that a two inch threaded, uh, that you might, you know, a, an ultrasonic uh, sensor, the smallest ones we've got are two inches in diameter. That doesn't fit through a one inch hole. So you can put a dip tube down there and uh, actually get your measurement. Uh, and again, you can match the material of the dip tube to whatever you're sticking it into. And the sensor that is usually the weak thing, the weak link in the whole measurement system, all it sees is clean, dry gas or air, so it lasts forever. And it does have a relatively low operating cost in terms of uh, gas or consumption. You know, one standard cubic foot per hour is not a whole bunch of uh, gas. Uh, in fact, sometimes people will actually use, uh, what do I want to call it, gas bottles. Uh, nitrogen gas bottles in order to run these for temporary measurements they're making. They'll haul the thing around and use that for their uh, pressure source. So that sums up what I've got for this. Now I'd like to ask if there are any questions. Dan, while we're waiting for questions, I just want to thank you very much for the presentation. If anybody does have specific application questions and we don't get them answered today, please feel free to give us a call at 809 Lessman. You can either ask for myself, Mike uh, DeLaCluse, or you can ask for Dan Weise. Either one of us will be happy to take care of you. Uh, we still don't have any questions, so I'll keep going here. Uh, if you want to know about other technologies we supply, please follow us on social media. Dan's blog is very active and has tons of great trick tips. All of our webinars are posted both on our website and on our Lessman Instrument Company YouTube channel. If you want to know when something new is posted, you can follow us on LinkedIn or Twitter. If there are some topics you'd like us to cover in our webinars, please send me an email with the subject, and that's just mikeD at Lessman.com. We have access to lots of products and lots of product specialists, so just about anything that you want us to cover, we can do for you. Uh, please let me know again, and, and uh, we'll, we'll get it on our schedule. I still don't have any questions. Well, thank you, so. Mike. Appreciate you guys uh, spending the time to uh, listen through our webinar today. At, at this point, we'll go ahead and conclude. Again, if you do have any questions, please e email it to uh, Dan. His email is just danw at lessman.com, uh, or send it to me, Mike D. A uh, question did just come in. And let's see if I can pull it up here. Uh, my screen's giving me a hard time. OK. Can a system be configured with two dip tubes such that a such that the specific gravity can be determined by DP and level with DP? So can you measure specific gravity and level using the same device? The idea would be to correct for a variable density. Uh, the problem is, let's go back here uh, real quick. I think what the problem is when we look at dual tubes, where we got a here we go for not for here we go density. The problem with uh, uh, you, you, it, with dual tubes, you're going to get a density or a specific gravity measurement out of this. Um, but you can't, we'd have to put a second transmitter on there, and the second transmitter would, would read off that bubble, uh, off the upper bubble, off either bubble tube, and we could do that. But it would take a second transmitter to do it. You can't do it with a single DP transmitter. Well, you probably even do it with a transducer as opposed to a transmitter at that uh -huh. point, because the uh, the accuracy is really needed you know, for the density. I have to, the thing that occurs to me, though, I'd have to look and see uh, for heart whether or not you can get the individual high side and low side readings out of a standard DP transmitter. 
You can on a, on a multivariable transmitter, but I'm not sure you can get them out of a standard DP. I know you can get, uh, you can get DP yeah. and you get temperature, but I don't think you can get the separate ones because they don't measure it separately. They measure it, you literally get a differential measurement. You don't get separate high and low sides on that, which leads me to believe that, again, I think you need a second. Yeah. Uh, second we'll, we'll, look in, we'll look into it and uh, get back to the uh, person that asked that question. Uh, any other questions? If if not, we'll go ahead and conclude. And again, please, if you uh, come up with a question after the uh, webinar, just send it to uh, myself or Dan. Thank you. At this point, we're going to go ahead and conclude. Thank you very much for attending.